Okay, welcome to the webinar on SDGs and transformations. Uh, transformation describes a change of great depth and breadth. One framing distinguishes transformation from incremental change and reform. The SDGs describe a global future for 2030. Today we're going to ask about what the relationship is between SDGs and transformation, and what are the implications for SDG 17 in particular, which is the only cross-cutting uh, SDG that focuses on the how. So this webinar is hosted by Future Earth and supported by the SDG Transformation Forum, the Future Earth Transformation Knowledge Action Network, and Geneva 2030. Future Earth is a platform to bring the knowledge and practice of sustainability science into the change processes of society. So before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. We're, we are recording this webinar so that it will be available online in the next day or two. There will be three presentations of approximately 10 minutes in length, and the remaining time in the one hour webinar will be for questions. If you have a question as an attendee, please type it in the chat box on your screen. And as time allows, we'll work through the questions, and I'll be calling on you to unmute your microphone and asking you to speak your question. At this point, I'd like to hand over the chair to Steve Waddell. Steve. Thanks so much, Christina. Um, one key element in realizing transformation is stimulating coherence. Uh, if a change efforts are moving in different directions, they undermine each other. So um, how do we get people moving in a similar direction? Well, the SGGs provide co coherence in their 17 goals by lining up nations of the world to move in their direction. But of course, there's many other uh, elements key for transformation, for instance, uh, that the goals themselves be transformational, um, uh, that, the, um, uh, that the profundity and challenge of, uh, uh, to our um, current ways of operating, and that they have the capacity to implement transformative action. We, can ask for transformation, but maybe we just don't have the capacity for it. And that we have the processes and institutions that will commit effort for the time uh, that's required to realize transformation, because transformation does not happen within a few years. Um, all of these issues are part of today's discussions, and we have a wonderful set of three lead discussants. Um, I have known uh, two of them for a long time, and I've become uh, familiar with Rosemary, who is our uh, lead speaker from uh, the, uh, she's the lead advisor on the 2030 agenda at the UNDP, and uh, she seems to me to bring the type of knowledge and energy and action that's uh, really uh, necessary to be able to uh, deal with the complexities and transformational capacities of the um, of the uh, SDGs. She has uh, 20 years experience working on development issues uh, with the United Nations and civil societies, uh, both at headquarters and in field locations. And she's taken leadership on addressing sustainable development issues, along with advocacy, communications, and partnership developments. Her expertise, she lists, includes sustainable development, governance, and social inclusion. And she's a passionate advocate of gender rights, human rights, Rights and disability rights. Welcome, Rosemary, to our webinar here. Um, we look forward to hearing your perspective on the SDGs and transformation. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good day, everyone. It's my uh, very real pleasure to be with you all. Uh, let me just share my screen. And um, uh, as Steve says, I work at uh, UNDP, the United Nations Development Programme, in the Bureau for Policy and Programme Support. And my job really is to think through what the uh, 2030 Agenda, which is aptly titled uh, Transforming Our World, uh, means for uh, institutions like the United Nations in general and uh, my organisation in particular. You know, when the SDGs were adopted, the Secretary General made a statement that these goals are a blueprint for a better future and that we must now use the goals to transform the world. But of course, we know that the world is not waiting for goals in order to transform and transformation is happening very, very rapidly, disruptively. Uh, the, the forces are changing at a rapid rate. 
uh, they are interacting with each other, the quality of change is different. And if you use uh, Google for mega trends, you will find many different cuts at it. The one on the screen is from a UNDP and UNRIST a Research Institute a publication. But they all address various facts of the context in which we have to think about sustainable development. And uh, let me just touch on a couple. One is inequality. Although the Millennium Development Goals, a predecessor framework to the SDGs, were very effective in reducing inequality across countries, inequality within countries has uh, increased. And there was this uh, uh, shocking um, Oxfam uh, statistic that uh, what eight men own the same wealth as the next 3.6 billion people who make the poorest half of uh, humanity. Uh, gender equality, the uh, gender inequalities, and the, uh, the kinds of inequalities that are exacerbated by conflict and climate change, the changing uh, demography, aging uh, in uh, Western Europe, North America, Asia, uh, Latin America, the young population in uh, Africa, which uh, represents a potential demographic uh, dividend, uh, international and internal migration, urbanization, uh, the, uh, all of these represent big changes. Environmental degradation and climate change, uh, I don't have to say more, except perhaps I do. You may have seen the news that uh, Trump is pulling the US out of the Paris Climate Accord. So perhaps what we accepted as known science and known facts, the urgency of the action uh, uh, needs more, more attention perhaps. Uh, the shocks and crises which have become uh, everyday news and the challenges of looking at how to harness technological innovations, look to every source of financing, both of which I will come to in a second. But it is at the, it, two years ago in September 2015, the world leaders collectively endorsed a global consensus known as the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It gave us uh, 17. SDGs with 169 targets spanning every aspect of, uh, of, of the, the pillars of sustainable development. Moreover, it came with a preamble which is stirring even to me and I have read it, uh, I don't know, a thousand times. Resolve to free the human race from the tyranny of poverty and to heal and secure our planet. To complete the unfinished business of the MDGs to focus not just on halving extreme poverty, which was a focus in the MDGs, but actually to eradicate poverty in all its forms and dimensions. That is demonstrating the scale and ambition of, of, of these goals. And a great leap forward is the recognition that the 17 SDGs are not separate, they are integrated and indivisible, and uh, span the three pillars, the economic, social, and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. They did not shy away from looking at human rights uh, and governance dimensions, as did the MDGs. They are universal, so not just for developing a uh, blueprint for developing countries, while so-called developed countries look on. Um, they pledged to leave no one behind and start with those left, furthest left behind first and include a uh, focus on reduction and management of risk. To me, every day, this is a beautiful and stirring agenda, and I have no problem aligning myself uh, fully with it and to see in it uh, a, a determination and a commitment of what the issues are, what the problems are, and how we need to move forward. In thinking through what it means for institutions and processes that uh, Steve referred to, uh, for me, the central is the integrated and indivisible part, looking at the complex interactions across the pillars. And while I was uh, thinking about it, you know, uh, the, the, there are the 11 um, uh, laws of systems thinking that Peter Senge put for, forward in the fifth dimension. And four always remain with me as I think about UNDP, the United Nations, and the multiple actors that make up the uh, global development uh, landscape which is, you know, today's problems come from yesterday's solutions and tomorrow's problems will come from today's solutions. Tomorrow's solutions will also come from today's decisions. So the, 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 the kinds of changes that we make today, the kind of consensus and agreements and knowledge we have today have critical uh, impact on what happens tomorrow. 
and that it's not usually just the easiest, the most politically expedient way or the, the narrow technical focus that each of us has that could be the solution because they ultimately lead back to the same complexities and that the changes that are needed are not necessarily obvious. They are very context specific. As UNDP, we work in uh, I don't know, 139 countries across the world in very, very different contexts from least developed countries to small island developing states, middle income countries, post-conflict crisis countries, uh, high middle income countries. And the, the changes that are needed in those environments are, are quite uh, different uh, if you really want to uh, touch what one of my colleagues called the acupressure point to create changes across the system. And most importantly, each of us doing our thing does not lead to the big picture that we want. Dividing an elephant in half does not provide, uh, produce two small elephants, as the, the law says. And last uh, week's webinar, Karen uh, talked about the personal, political and pragmatic fears, spheres uh, for transformational change. The belief systems, the collective values, the institutions, the processes, the policies that are needed. And at the UN, what we have been trying to think through, because the push towards looking at easy targets, easy to measure indicators, all of those leads us to the small elephants, uh, small parts of the elephant rather than the big elephant, right? It, it is making us rethink how our work in different pillars of dimension fit together. What are the trade-offs and synergies? How do we look at the work of the humanitarians or the peace actors that we didn't look at before? What are the kind of partnerships that we need to begin to take much more seriously? What, how do we measure and factor in a risk in a much better way? And that leads us to SDG 17, uh, which is really a, a, the connector of all of the goals, the means of implementation, it's called, I've, I've, I've labeled it means of transformation, because without it, the other 16 goals will flounder. We need to recognize that the United Nations and member states, they are, they are, the governments are small actors the future really rests in the private sector, in civil society, in parliamentarians, in academics, think tanks, all coming together and uh, walking in the same direction and uh, creating the space for such inclusive partnerships. It means looking at the policy coherence or lack thereof uh, among the various initiatives that we take. Um, I read somewhere that the financing flows uh, from development aid are at the peak, 142.6 billion in 2016. But that is, of course, a drop in the bucket of what is needed if you really have to finance the SDGs. We know the capital is out there. We just have to be able to tap into them for, for development. And last week in New York, the ECOSOC Forum for Financing for Development just concluded and there was a, a, a focus on looking, for example, at development financing assessments, looking at the landscape of potential financing flows, and then taking governments uh, through integrated financing solutions. Where do these solutions lie, domestic and international, public and private, and how can they be tapped? The whole area of data, technology, innovation is going to be critical because it can make the determination between whether there is a gap or whether those opportunities are really leveraged uh, uh, for making the progress. Data disaggregation, data uh, inclusiveness, uh, that is going to be critical in terms of understanding where we go. And finally, I just want to say goals are no goals. Uh, the economy is transforming, the world is transforming. Uh, I, yesterday, I did not have the slide, uh, the headline up there, US withdraws from climate agreements. What we thought was a global consensus we know is being threatened every day. We need to hold on to it and really make our, uh, ourselves come together in a way that changes these headlines into the vision that is in the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rosemary. Um, a wonderful perspective on the challenges of just um, moving ahead when in this uh, sea of uncertainty. Um, next, we have Kumi Naidu. Um, he's a steward with Africans Rising currently, 
I've known Kumi for quite a few years, originally as Secretary General for Civicus, um, where he was for several years, Civicus being the global network organization of civil society. Uh, he moved to be the head of uh, Greenpeace International. Uh, he was uh, the chair of the Global Call to Action Against Poverty. And he's uh, been involved in the process of developing the SDGs and has a, a particularly critical uh, concern about the SDGs and their role and potential for transformation. So please uh, welcome Kumi. Thank you, Kumi. Thank you, Steve. Um, greetings, everybody. Um, so firstly, one might start off with making the point of is SDGs and transformation comfortably sit together? Now, if, of course, words on a piece of paper, notwithstanding the huge amount of effort that went into putting those words on a piece of paper, is to be taken in place. Yes, sorry? Just to interrupt, you can go to um, a slideshow view uh, rather than the current view, if you like. That's the one? To show your whole slide. Um, that's better. Is that better? I see you too. Uh, it's better, but uh, down at the bottom of your slide, you can go to slideshow view. There, it, yep, it just, yep, click that. Okay, gotcha. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Thank you. Uh, so, um, the question that I would pose is, can we expect transformation to come from institutions that are ill-equipped, undemocratic, and non-transparent? So my starting point is that while the, MD, the SDGs on paper sound positive and good, we cannot put our energies in expecting that the powerful institutions that control the planet will in fact make those change on, changes on a timeline and with the urgency that, it's record, uh, that is called for, because too many of the players within the process are highly compromised in terms of their own policy positions. If we take, for example, the World Economic Forum, for the last five years, inequality was talked about um, as, a very, as the number one issue. But clearly, the beneficiaries of inequality are not the ones that are going to deliver equality. So how do we solve the systemic structural problem? I believe that too much of emphasis should not be placed on existing intergovernmental organizations because the whole intergovernmental system uh, is suffering from several deficits a legitimacy deficit a democratic deficit a transparency deficit a coherence uh, a deficit and a compliance deficit uh, you know where nice decisions are made such as the sdgs uh, with very low level of compliance so we need to be thinking about uh, uh, oops uh, new forms of uh, new forms of organizing, and if we do not uh, build serious citizen pressure, and we get our gaze wrong, let me just explain this term. I think too much of our gaze, and I'm I do this as a self-critical reflection on my activism over the years, is towards those with power. I believe we need to change our gaze towards those that are powerless. And in fact, change is going to come from people being organized and mobilized and being able to push for that which they need uh, along the lines of what's in the SDGs. But I think the idea of expecting the UN system or the World Bank or the IMF and so on to deliver the kind of leadership that we need or want is a pipe dream. Uh, now, the next slide that I wanted to show you here is just how deep this problem is. Uh, when we look at even from the civil society perspective, okay, if you look at civil society organizations and what they are investing in, right, and if we take the left hand column, which I call level of intervention macro, meso, micro, which is governance change, policy change, delivery of projects and programs. Uh, and if you look at the level of investment, 
we still find that um, the most of the most of the investment actually is on delivery of uh, projects and programs. Uh, at best, fifteen percent is on policy change, and at best, five percent on governance changes. So, quite frankly, even if you look at it from a civil society point of view and civil society organizations that are pursuing the SDGs, a lot of the effort will go into treating the symptom of the problem rather than necessarily uh, treating the root causes of the problem. So this year is my guesstimation, which I did in a book that I did in 2010, which, uh, which it was based on observation and some research and so on of how our... So if you got this as the civil society reality, then think about how big the problem is uh, when we think about uh, the political power brokers themselves. So I want to move to my last slide on the... Uh, I, I, I consciously am focusing on the goal on inequality here rather than goal 17 uh, because my starting point is that because the institutional failure is so deep, we should be very cautious about expecting a flawed institutional architecture to deliver the kinds of results that we want. And, you know, when we look, if the UN would be considered to be the most democratic of intergovernmental organizations, but even if you look at the UN, we can see the disproportionate power that the five permanent members actually exercise. And the SDGs is not going to tackle that democratic deficit. So let's be clear, the US uh, will continue, for example, to exercise the kind of influence uh, that they do, which is not appropriate. So I would argue, though, that the in order to the SDGs, as Rosemary mentioned, is a package, right? But I want to suggest that in thinking about the transformational cap capability of this package, that we need to be recognizing that the package has some problems within it. And if I can quote you from an innovative NGO called The Rules, they say the SDGs contradictory relationship. Uh, oops, sorry, I'm struggling with my screen here. Yeah. The SDGs contradictory relationship to growth extends to its approach uh, to global poverty. Basically, in essence, uh, just in the interest of time, I would say that. Uh, if you take the growth goals and put them against the climate goals, if you pursue the growth goals within a business as usual approach, that in fact what we do is we end up with completely bursting our carbon budget, just to put that as, as, as one uh, factor. Then uh, let me conclude by saying that I think if we do not address inequality, as a fundamental central part of the SDGs, we do not have a chance to move in the direction of contradiction. But addressing inequalities means that we have to address, for example, CEO compensation, uh, the uh, bonus cultures, uh, and all of that, all of which we need to do if we're going to address what I increasingly am calling the biggest global disease that we face, which is uh, uh, affluenza, which is a tendency of those of, at the top, right? Including countries at the top as well as individuals in the top within societies want to, you know, uh, suffer from a pathology of more, you know, is never enough. Uh, and so we need to, uh, in thinking about what transformational potential the SDGs have, factor that in. So let me end with this comment. Bottom line is, the SDGs is a product of a lot of effort, a lot of uh, conversation, a lot of uh, battles. It is imperfect. It is sounds nice on, 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 on words on a paper. Uh, but from history, we know that we cannot take it at face value. However, I would conclude by saying what Roberto Bissio, the head of Social Watch, said in 2003 
on reflecting on the Millennium Development Goals. He said when the Millennium Development Goals were first, uh, were first uh, outlined, civil society did not gravitate towards it because we saw it as minimalist development goals uh, and the feminist movement saw it as MDGs, they said stood for mass diversionary gimmick to turn the attention of civil society activism into a framework that straightjacketed them in particular ways and so on. However, he said, and this was in 2003, after the tragedy of September 11, 2001, and with the whole global politics moving so much to the right, that in that current context, in that context in 2003, the Millennium Development Goals read like a revolutionary document. So from a civil society perspective, we are in a very difficult situation with the SDGs, because on the one hand, we see the contradictions, we see the imbalance and so on, but we also recognize that the, that the moment we are in is in fact a one with you know Brexit, the elections of a fascist in the United States as president and so on. Given all of that, um, you know, you could say the SDGs now with what's and all, we have to find a way of strategically pushing the individual goals and the collective package while not doing it without understanding the contradictions that we have to manage at the same time. So I'm not suggesting that the SDGs have absolutely no transformational potential, it does, but with many caveats and with many uh, barriers to actually make that happen, and I would conclude by saying that it is popular mobilization and ordinary people's engagement is what we need to, to ensure the kind of transformation that is necessary. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Kumi. Important conditions for being able to use uh, the SDGs as a transformational tool. Next, we have uh, Per Olson. He's theme leader for the Resilience Science for Transformation stream at the Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, his current research focuses on agency and system entrepreneurship, and social ecological innovations, sustainability transformation, and how to reverse current trends of crossing critical thresholds, tipping points in the Earth system. Um, welcome, Pear. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. And I hope that you can see me and that you can see my slides and that you can hear me. Um, so uh, I think this follows very well uh, on, on, the, on the previous presentations. And I'm, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the social ecological perspectives that we have here at the work with here and in the research that we're doing at the Stockholm Resilience Center. I'm going to talk a little bit about innovation concerns about innovation that I have and also around agency. So I think this follows really well on, on what's been said already, that there are a lot of um, uh, transformation processes in place already, it's big, large-scale transformations happening with sometimes good intentions. And I think uh, some of these projects will also say that they are addressing the, trying to address the, the SDGs. But um, as we know that a lot of these projects also tend to push us out of the safe and, and just space um, for the planet and create huge um, problems that are um, increasingly hard, hard to, to solve. So one of the things that we, um, that we, uh, uh, that we uh, see as a central problem here at the center is that we we need to move from the sort of the triple bottom line thinking uh, and towards a more when the triple bottom line thinking as you as you know turns often into um, um, uh, a sort of the economics dominating and you get this mickey mouse picture and what we what we argue is that it's instead of the triple bottom line it's we actually you need to see um, sort of move towards a human in nature perspective where we we talk about the 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 planet and its ecosystems as fundamental for our survival and uh, that we are uh, 
totally embedded in that. And that's, that's, that's a sort of a mental movement that we have to do. We also have been working a lot on, on, on trying to, trying to um, uh, develop concepts like ecosystem services, et cetera, to, to, um, to communicate the interaction in that model. So that's what we, how we see the, the, the SDGs that we need to organize them they, maybe in a different way. So avoid uh, solving them in silos and thinking more about these kind of social ecological interactions. So this is a very sort of important and central uh, point in, in our research that we do. And with that, uh, it raises some concerns that I have uh, about the, the, the current developments in, uh, around the SDGs. And there is a lot of things, good things going on. And, and, and Goal 17 uh, lists a lot of good, good things going on, and which is um, projects all over the world that are trying to address a uh, uh, few or several of the, of the sustainable development goals. And this is part of a sort of a general trend of, of, of lifting um, and visualizing good examples and, and moving from just stating the problems to actually uh, look at some of the solutions. But I would, I, my concern is that it, um, it, it has spurred a lot of innovation, but it's, it's almost like it creates a noise of innovation. And very few are talking about how all these good things around the world will actually lead to the large scale transformations that we, that we, uh, that we need and that, that the SDGs has a potential for doing. So there is like, I agree with, with Richard Horton, who was at this conference at some point and tweeted from a World Health Organization uh, conference. And Richard Horton is, is uh, very much involved in that organization. He's also a chief editor of Lancet. And he said, uh, tweeting from this meeting, like innovation, 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 the most meaningless word in the lexicon of global health. So I think it's, it's a similar tendency here that I want to raise this concern that how do we go from just talking about innovation to actually think about the, the, the transformative impact? And there are a couple of things that I, uh, that I want to raise, a couple of concerns about innovation that I want to raise. The first one is that um, uh, the, the innovation is not really uh, disruptive and as has been pointed out before it doesn't change the system conditions that created the problems in the first place so the example here is this uh, is this bed for homeless people that has been uh, developed to make life a bit um, easier for the homeless living on the street but it doesn't change the systemic problem of uh, homelessness in society the other point is, of course, and that's also been brought up already, is that you need to be, have inclusive innovation and also stop, um, uh, stop sort of the, the, the traditional knowledge transfer where the North is, is going to save the, the South and innovate for the South. So it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's a funny project that was happening a couple of years ago that turned the, the the, the world map upside down and talked about design for the first world and the rest saving the West. And I think this is, is a sort of a fresh perspective on things that, that uh, turns around this sort of uh, traditional knowledge uh, transfer uh, that we have. The third one is, is the, a lot of the innovation that is pushed to help us say, um, reach sustainability are talking about uh, how do we uh, how do we reduce our negative impacts of, of our actions? And a lot of the innovation are, are, for, are for that. And uh, what we mean is that with 10 billion people on the planet, it's not enough if everybody just reduced their negative impact. We have to start to think about how humans can have a, have a positive impact and be a positive force uh, on the planet. Uh, and my, my, um, my colleague here, Owen Gaffney, uh, also at Future Earth, he talks about the being biosphere positive. So I think that's sort of wraps it up in what we call social ecological innovation, the need to, to think about how um, innovation can change the system dynamics that created the, the problems in the first place, changing things like resource flows and, and roles and routines and power dynamics and values and norms, etc., but also fundamentally change our interaction with the planet. So uh, 
really fundamentally changing uh, social ecological feedbacks and enhance the, and help enhance the capacity of ecosystems to generate essential services. Uh, of course, there is a scaling issue also that we talk about. How do we scale things in order to um, to um, uh, an innovation to continue to have, have benefit people on the planet as we as it is scaled up? And we have a lot of examples like biofuels that when uh, an innovation is scaled up and incorporated into the global economy it has huge negative effect, negative effect on the social and ecological dimensions. We think about scaling up in, and often as, as something small becoming bigger, but I wonder if we can also start questioning that and talk about scaling up, scaling out, but also scaling deep, which is more about how do we reach these sort of deeper values and norms in society as part of scaling. So I just want to finish off with just talking a little bit about agency because I think it's important also because in, in this sort of push for solution and, and so on, it's a lot about how individuals are these kind of heroes or heropreneurs that's going to help us save the world. And we need to move from, from, from that to looking more towards the, the sort of distributed agency that is needed to achieve um, uh, transformative change and building these kind of networks of, of actors. So there is this, um, this um, concept of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, which is used to describe some of this agency. And I think it's important um, and it's a useful way of looking at things because as in this quote from, from um, Edwin Land, who invented the Polaroid uh, camera, he says that, that uh, he says that every innovation has two parts. The first is the invention of the thing itself, and the second is the preparation of expectations, so that the, when the invention arrives, it seems both surprising and familiar, something long awaited. So you both have the role of people introducing an idea, but also the role of people uh, and networks to open up uh, institutional context for that innovation to have impact. So um, and this is. Um, my finishing slide is then uh, about this sort of how do we study and how do we understand agency for change in complex adaptive systems. And we think about these sort of different roles that people and, and networks and groups um, have in systemic change and in the sort of the multi-level perspective, how social entrepreneurs might be the ones that introduce an idea, how institutional how social entrepreneurs introduce the idea, how institutional entrepreneurs open up the regime, open up, work the regime to both build new institutions, but also to uh, break down and reduce um, um, the sort of, or, or reduce um, uh, the impact of the old system as was, as was also mentioned here, that there, need, there are need, things that needs to break down uh, and others that needs to be built up. And then some people talk about moral entrepreneurs. They're more focusing on the sort of the, the broader institutional landscape like culture and, and, and uh, worldviews and, and values and, and norms, et cetera. And uh, we bring all of these together into, uh, because I think we, we need to understand the interaction between these into this sort of uh, concept of system entrepreneurship to really understand how all these um, um, individual and group efforts comes together to to achieve systemic change so i'll stop there much pair um i know when the uh, all of the discussants were speaking i was uh, reflecting on donella mello's um mm -hmm. leverage points in a system um everyone was talking about systems and aware i think that's a a real big move that we've made over the last five or ten years is that people now do talk in terms of systems um so uh, her most powerful point of leverage was to change the mindset or paradigm out of which the system, its goals, power, structure, rules, and cultures arises. Um, the second most powerful one she suggested is to change the goals of the system. So here we are with the SDGs. 
And then the third most powerful one is to suggest, uh, is to redistribute the power over the rules of the system, which I think um, uh, Kumi was particularly getting at. And so part of our challenge is how to do all of these things at the same time, it seems to me. Um, how do we have the existing system, the reality of it, and the paradox of what, of its, uh, of the existing system, um, having an agency role in giving uh, birth to the new system, but also, as Kumi was pointing out, um, embedded in the current system are the very limitations and ideas and structures that limit the emergence of the new. So this is one of the great paradoxes of transformation. I would like to turn to people who are in our audience and are participating in this webinar to be able to get some of their thoughts about uh, what they've heard and questions. Um, I would like to, if possible, go directly to people to use their audio. Um, I see that uh, Rosalind King has a couple of questions here. Um, Rosalind, uh, would you like to try your mic uh, to be able to uh, share uh, with us your questions that uh, or comments that you would like for us to enter into further discussion about? Um, Christina, can uh, Rosalind as might be um, freed? Hi, Steve. Her, her mic is open. Rosalind, you can go ahead and speak okay. if you have access to a mic. If not, if we don't hear you shortly, then Steve, you can go ahead and read the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of her questions are, what are the roles to be played by key contributors from each aspect of society uh, towards this end? And uh, another, um, uh, oh, I'm having trouble getting to the questions too. Um, uh, Christina, would you like to read out any other questions that you see here? Sure. So Rosalind had a second question. It was, transformational change is a huge task within itself. How do we build leadership at all levels, which would be important to successful transformations? To eradicate inequality everywhere is perhaps the largest task. How do we transform consciousness? Great question. Thanks, Rosalind. And maybe we could take a couple more and then just have some comments from the panel. Um, uh, Yobu Sakona, would you like to try your mic? Hello. Hello. Uh, it was uh, yes. one of my questions is related to this uh, uh, leadership aspect because uh, system leadership, none of them talk about it. And that's crucial if you want. And transformation uh, 2030 is uh, in the corner. And transformation requires time, and time is not. I think we're losing the objective. Time. And the question is how I can be challenged. Hello? Hello? Okay. Okay, let me read it out because I think you broke up a little bit, Yoaba. Um, so uh, 20 th 2030 is in the corner. Transformation requires time and time is not available to be able to achieve the 2030 objective. And the question is how to tackle this challenge, <laughs> the time challenge. Uh, yes, absolutely a challenge. Um, would you... Um, uh, like to answer any of these uh, questions. Anyone from the panel? Your mics are open. Kumi, please well, go like, ahead. I'd like to pick up on Caroline's question around consciousness because I do think that that's a critical part of uh, the puzzle. And uh, we tend to uh, lean towards macro narratives quite often and big. Uh, infrastructure solutions and other big solutions but in fact uh, transformation comes from individuals and we the reason I raised the affluenza point is that 
we have uh, been led to believe that happiness comes from acquisition of more, more, and more. And unless we break that uh, kind of cycle, we, we, we stuck so that, you know, once you get people who have the opportunity of accumulation, they will go for maximizing accumulation as much as possible. So, uh, yeah, I should just share with you a wisdom that uh, I learned from Martin Luther King that I think is really ap uh, appropriate at this time. When he said, uh, speaking in 1965, he said, you know, my friends, um, I know that in the field of psychology, we have a very dominant term called maladjusted. Uh, now, we all want to be well adjusted and not suffer from schizophrenia and other problems. However, my friends, he said, uh, there are certain things in our world that are so immoral and unjust, we should refuse to be well adjusted. And importantly, he said, we should refuse to be well adjusted to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty. So there is a conversation, I think, around consciousness that has to be linked to a word that we all seem to run away from, and that is consumption. Uh, you know, we, we've got skewed consumption patterns, and one of Pei's uh, uh, diagrams, the upside down map one, kind of uh, you know, gave an indication of that a little bit. So I can only agree with Caroline that addressing the question of consciousness is critical. Uh, however, having said that, it is incredibly difficult because sadly, most analysts and public actors tend to think that governments control us primarily through the repressive state apparatus of army, police, formal laws, and so on, when in fact, the more insidious forms of control that are exercised by those in power is in fact the deployment of the ideological state apparatus, which is your schooling system, framework for religion, and particularly the media environment. So I would say, while I agree that this is a critical success factor, if we're going to move forward, uh, I would acknowledge how incredibly difficult it is when we have the kind of corporatized media environment within which we operate. Thank you, Kumi. Rosemary? Hi, I'd like to pick up on uh, Kumi's point. You know, the thing is that there is a narrative about what is wrong, but the narrative coexists with another narrative of what is wrong. I live in the United States and those two narratives, uh, extreme on either side, coexist. It depends on what media you subscribe to and you subscribe to the ones that reinforce your own worldviews. And therefore, it is troubling that you know, while we have the consensus of the global goals, for example, we are unable to break through. For me, for example, the Paris Climate Agreement speaks a truth that was desperately needed to be told. And while we celebrated the agreement, it seems like it can be ripped apart by the very forces that Nikumi is speaking about. And that segues into the point, the question that was asked about the roles of key contributors. I don't pretend that the UN or the SDGs uh, have any greater force uh, uh, than, than anybody else. And in fact, uh, uh, the future of multilateralism indeed is, at, uh, is in question. But I do think we have a role in the advocacy. And what we are advocating for in the kinds of work that we're doing anyway makes a difference. And to me, the fact that after 20 years in the system, we are now advocating for a holistic look at the kind of in, uh, development we do, not just at growth, by the way. In the, in, across the goals, what we are saying is there are synergies and trade-offs. If you pursue only one pillar of development, growth, for example, it is going to lead to very bad catastrophic effects for the other pillars, and therefore development by definition will not be sustainable. So I think the roles that the different actors can play in using the narrative of the SDGs is going to be uh, hugely important going forward. And the narrative that we have in the SDGs for me is a comforting one. But we need to be able to find ways to talk together enough uh, and, and in, uh, in one voice so that it can drown out some of the other rubber rousers who seem to have greater currency, at least in the country where I am these days. 
Thank you. It seems to me we're speaking a bit to the challenge of the early adopters versus the laggards and how uh, we can mobilize the energy and maintain the energy of those who are uh, in favor of the change and to overcome the resistance of those who oppose it. Um, an ongoing battle never ends. Um, I'd like to uh, turn perhaps to um, Jerry Hush. Uh, Jerry, um, you had several questions here. Would you like to um, pick out something in particular from what you had to say that you'd like to share? You can do it on your microphone. Still muted. Ah, can you hear me now? We can indeed. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. First, I'd like to thank all three of the commentaries. I worked for UNDP and I worked on the Millennium Development Goals and the SDG. So this is an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, I, I think I'd like to build a bridge, though, between the various comments that are being made. I, I think we have sort of two ends of the spectrum. And I'm going to do that by being very what I call operational. Uh, the SDGs are more than just abstract goals. They've been transformed by the need to measure indicators. And the indicator question, I think, is where we can really begin to look at the action that's assumed to occur to enable us to achieve the SDGs. Um, I'd like to hear from the panel your view on the way in which the method of measuring and monitoring the changes that are being assumed that is the indicators, have an impact on the capacity, capacity to be transformative. Um, from my perspective, I think that if we really look at the precise indicators that are being measured, that's the place where we can make significant change because that's at the level of real people being transformed into some kind of, uh, I don't know, number, if you will. And I think if we can engage in, in conversations, transformative conversations, and perhaps revolutionary conversations about the way in which we're actually collecting information about the change, then the SDGs have the potential to be um, much more radical than they are right now. So I'd like to get some feedback from you. We also have the, a similar comment from Alice, uh, uh, Weza, uh, she asked, uh, how can we measure transformation? What kind of data and data sets do we need for that? Any thoughts from our panel? Go ahead, Steve. Uh, go ahead, Rosemary. You had something you wanted to? Okay, um, I can speak uh, to the issue of indicators. Uh, I have to say, uh, you know, my my experience with the SDG indicators, I wasn't so involved with the MDG indicators process, so I can't speak to it. Uh, you know, at the moment, we have um, the interagency group on uh, uh, data and statistics for the SDGs have come up with a group of 232 indicators so far, so far because they are still debating additional indicators. It is a technical exercise, and you're right, Jerry, that it could be transformative in, in, in um, uh, deciding what to measure, because if you don't measure it, it isn't counted. But uh, it is also a political exercise. And uh, the reason they still have not been able to get a formal endorsement uh, of the indicators, and they've agreed that this is going to be work in progress. Uh, the, the goals are uh, comprehensive, they touch on every issue possible, but you can see the practical realities coming into play as member states cannot agree on the indicators. Uh, the Goal 16 indicators in particular are very sensitive. Among the indicators too, there is a very large number of indicators that have neither data or a certain group of indicators known as Tier 3 indicators have neither data nor methodology. So uh, different agencies, for instance, have been asked to take uh, what they call custodianship roles for various indicators. Uh, UNDP, as an example, has a custodianship role for multidimensional poverty, as well as some indicators under Goal 16. 
So all of this is a long-winded way of saying it, we are a long ways off in seeing indicators as transformative. But for me, the process is as important as the outcome. Uh, we, for example, are working on what we call data ecosystems. So working with national statistics offices to have them try and broaden what is considered official data, especially if you want to talk about leaving no one behind, then there is the challenge of deciding who is being left behind, why they are being left behind, what are the causes for them being left behind, and if in fact the people in charge are responsible for leaving them behind, it becomes an extremely difficult exercise. So this is why the whole issue of data indicators and statistics for the SDGs is really critical. I agree with you, the potential is there, but we are a long ways off. And I think, just to add, can I add something? Just this issue the, the, that there are also work going on in trying to link the different indicators of the different goals, right? So as to avoid this uh, problem of solving each goal on their own and really trying to find integrated solutions to, to these linked problems, which I think is an interesting uh, endeavor too. I would just add one, uh, one, sorry, can I just add one quotation from Albert Einstein? Well, it's like one of those Albert Einstein's quotation where you're not 100% sure it came from Albert Einstein, but anyway, it goes, not everything, not everything that comes can be measured and not everything that can be measured counts. And I think that one of the things about the MDGs that really irritated me quite a lot in terms of looking at how this whole industry of measurement that was being built around it. So yes, I think you know a, a reasonable level of assessment and resources going into assessing progress is one thing, but when you make it a kind of very technocratic exercise, uh, trying to measure things that it's impossible to measure and so on, I think there are some issues. But I think the point that was made was a good point, and I agree about how to try and straddle those very complicated bridges. Thank you. Mm. Yes, uh, we'll be having a webinar on measurement because uh, one of the problems is simply about how measurement is uh, thought of and how it's applied and how people are not engaged, but they're etc. in the traditional scientific paradigm. Um, but uh, I would like to wrap up by offering um, 30 seconds to each of our uh, guests here with any further comments or inspiration they might like to provide uh, to people who are looking at the SDGs and transformation and uh, what they can do to be able to support development of this connection. Can you, Per, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, well, I think it's, it's interesting with listening to uh, the others here and and uh, think about transformative capacity that we need to move uh, through uh, transformation. So I think uh, it actually has clarified a bit to me, you know, the different capacities that are associated with breaking down maybe uh, the, the, the current uh, regime and uh, working on that as well as building, start to prepare for system change, but also to uh, the capacity needed to navigate those thresholds and when when opportunity opens and you 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 um, uh, need a different capacity maybe to to push your ideas forward and uh, and how then the I think the SDGs can can work as a sort of a guide in that you know to navigate this those transitions those to navigate that just and safe space so I think that became has become clearer to me. Um, I think that imperfect and complex as the SDG package is, it does offer us an opportunity to mobilize a different kind of narrative and a different kind of popular participation around pushing for some of these individual goals as well as the package. I think we need to do it with vigilance, uh, with our understanding of the contradictions, and not see the SDGs as some biblical document, but see it as a guide that does have potential if pursued with 
courage and so on. But I have to say the kinds of questions that have come from uh, some of the participants, I think, are exactly in the right direction of the kind of emphasis and focus we need to have moving forward. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And Rosemary. Thank you. Um, I personally, I'm excited about the SDGs. Uh, I think that uh, one and a half years after the adoption of the 2030 Agenda, we are much further along than we were five years perhaps after the adoption of the MDGs. They do represent a global consensus and I like the consensus that it represents. And at least in my little part of UNDP, I am beginning to see a real seriousness in looking at all three pillars on working together. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about this issue of acceleration and that acceleration is really trying to address the contradictions that Kumi refers to across the pillars. It is about trade-offs and synergies and giving advice in terms of what the leverage points might be to have progress that is actually sustainable. So I'm excited. I think that the more we have conversations like this with uh, people from civil society, academia, uh, private sector especially, um, we're going to be on the right track. So, optimism. Thank you. Thank you so much for that energy and wisdom. Uh, we'll take it back into our daily work. Uh, announcement about the next webinar. Um, Christina. Great. Thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Thank you to our um, presenters and our, our chair, Steve. Um, the next webinar in this session will be held um, on Friday, June 9th, 9 a.m. Eastern, 1500 Central European, 1830 India. It'll be on emerging meta narratives and transformation. Um, and everyone who signed up, registered for this webinar will get details of this next webinar in a follow-up email in the next day. Thank you so much. And with that, I bid you all adieu and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.